Amen. Aren't you glad we serve a big God? Amen. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Let's turn to number 42 together. Number 42. Let's all stand as we sing. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. And I just found out our pianist doesn't have our... All right, on that first together. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and the new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved singing tonight. Good to see you back in church and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us this evening. Let's bow for a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you tonight. We thank you for the, another opportunity to be here on a Sunday evening. Thank you for each one that's made their way here to the service tonight. And Lord, we bow here before you at the beginning of the service and we ask you to meet with us this evening and uh, do what only you can do here in our midst. Lord, we need a revival in our country. Yes. We need we need it to, in every single state, in every yes. single city of every yes. state. And, Lord, we just need a moving of God. Yes. And I pray you would begin one even in this place. And yes. so we yield to you and ask you to do your will in each of our lives tonight. Lord, I pray each of us would just draw that circle and step inside of it and say, start a revival in this yes. circle. And let it be in each of our own hearts tonight. Have your will and way, please. We'll thank you for what you'll do. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be Amen. seated. 355, 355 in your hymnal. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. 355, we're going to sing all three stanzas together. On that first. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall I come? Yeah. 
a few announcements for us now and uh, regular schedule this week seven o'clock right here uh, Wednesday night for the Wednesday night service and uh, all together on Wednesday night at seven and then uh, the regular schedule throughout the week with the RU on Thursday night down at the prison and Friday night right here uh, it's seven o'clock and then our soul winning and bus visitation Saturday at 10 o'clock and uh, the RU out at London at 8 30 in the morning and um, then, of course, right into next Sunday service. I do want to let you know, we, um, if you remember last year during the uh, missions conference, we were in the Grove City Parade, uh, the Arts in the Alley Parade, which is going to be on the 17th of September this year. And uh, we, did we do 2,000, John and Romans, last year? Was that 2,000 or 2,500? And we were going to double that to 5,000. And I talked to Brother Phil Taylor uh, this afternoon, and uh, they will come here and we can put those together here. And um, it will be August 15, 16, and then we'll dedicate them Wednesday night the 17th of August, yeah. okay? We'll do it each evening, okay? The evening of the 15th, the evening of the 17th. If he, had, he said, if we have 20 people, he says, we can do 5,000 John and Romans in eight hours. Uh, I think we'll have more than 20 people. Uh, so we'll, we'll be able to do more than that if we want. And uh, we'll just set whatever number we want to try to get done, and uh, we'll get those done in those two nights and then dedicate them in the service on Wednesday night. Won't that be great? So we'll get to put them together, and then we'll get to pass them out on the, the 17th of September. Uh, so that'll be exciting. So we'll look forward to that. And uh, write that down on your calendar, if you would. And uh, you, you join us as, as you're able to uh, on those two nights. We'll probably... Uh, pass around a sign-up sheet before then so we kind of know who to expect and how many will be participating and he said all ages Okay, and uh, everybody's allowed to come. He says there's something everybody can do and uh, So it's uh, most of it is sitting down work. So it's not like you got to be in your feet all the time uh, It'll be uh, it'll be a great great time Okay, so we'll look forward to that August 15 16 and then 17 uh, for at least uh, 5,000 John and Romans that will pass out uh, during the Grove City Parade. Okay? <clears throat> All right, let's take just a moment and we'll welcome our guests in the service tonight. And uh, if you're here tonight with a guest or if you're visiting on your own, we'd love to meet you, find out who you are and where you're from. Uh, anybody here tonight? Uh, we have some visitors right here. Why don't you introduce them for us, please? Hold on. Hey, come on. Stand up. <laughs> Thank you, Desiree. All right. Kevin, Kristen. All right. Great. Good to have you folks with us this evening. That's wonderful. The usher is coming, and he's going to give you a card. I think you know the usher. And uh, he'll give you a card to fill out so you, we can have a record of your visit with us tonight. 
Okay, anybody else here tonight for the very first time? Right back here. This is, go ahead. That's great. Amen. It's good to see you, John. And? All right, go ahead and introduce you. Good to see you. Amen. Glad you're here. Yeah, that's all right. All right, good to see you. Amen. That's good. All right. Does that cover everybody tonight? Okay, if you'll take just a moment and fill out the card. Uh, we appreciate you doing that. In a little bit, we have the offering. Just drop that in the plate if you would. We'll have a record of your visit with us this evening. Let's give our guests a warm welcome, shall we? Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. 249. <clears throat> On that first. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shed of this failing with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. And glory filled my soul. Oh, and at the cross, the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away. spirit with life from above into God's family divine. I'm justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proper. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. 
good. Would you go over to uh, number 56? Number 56, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. 56, would you stand with me as you find that? <coughs> on that first together. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last scene together.
In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For t'was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. together to the old rugged cross I will ever be true. When we get to the chorus we'll have the uh, pianist drop out on that last. To the old rugged cross I will never be true. It's shame. Good singing. You may be seated. Wonderful. Ushers are coming, and we'll get our offering ready to give tonight. As the Lord has blessed and prospered you, and appreciate your faithful giving throughout the summertime. And uh, let's ask God's blessing on our giving tonight. Brother Bill, lead us in our prayer, please. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunities we have to uh, serve you and learn more about you. Uh, bless both the gift and the giver today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, please. We are going to read verses 2 through 10 <coughs> of 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 2 through 10. We'll begin together on 2, and I'll read 3. We'll alternate like that till we end together on verse 10 of 1 Chronicles chapter 28. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 2, 1 Chronicles 28. Ready? Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the government of the Lord. 
and of the footstool of our God, and he made ready for the building. But God said to me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And all of my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever. If he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments, as at this day. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. And thou, Solomon my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, He will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. And let's pray. Father, please add your blessing this evening to the reading of the scripture. And Father, I pray that you will and you have prepared us with the music this evening. And it's sure been good to listen to the people of God sing the songs of God. And Lord, I pray that you now would be ready to speak to our hearts with the Spirit of God through the Word of God. Lord, that each of us would yield ourselves to you and give each of us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to our church this evening. So Lord, use the special to further prepare us and put us in tune with you to hear the message from your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
must be forgiven to make heaven your home. The good life you're living won't do it alone. So trust in the Savior and he'll save you today. And with blessings. Father, we bow now in prayer and we're thankful, Lord, that we're saved to the uttermost. Lord, I think about starting out singing, how I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. And Lord, we sung this morning, I think, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. What a change takes place when we come to know Christ as our Savior. Lord, I pray that this evening that you'd help us now as we open up your word and preach it. We look at this passage from First Chronicles and how David had it in his heart and to build a house for you. You'll help us to glean some truths from this passage tonight that will help us uh, here in 2016 as we seek to live for you and labor for you and be part of a New Testament Baptist church. And so, Father, speak to our hearts tonight. Give me help as I bring the message. Please give the people help as they listen. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. First Chronicles chapter 28, if you turn your Bible open there again, we're going to look at this passage together this evening. And, you know, as I said a minute ago, David had it in his heart to build God a house. Now, all through the years, God had used prophets and he had used priests and the tabernacle to communicate with his people. Why build him a house? We understand, and, and certainly I, David would understand, God couldn't dwell in a house. God couldn't just have a place that could contain him. But uh, he, he wanted to do something for God. You know, once you're saved and you really come to understand the great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven, that we possess eternal life. We don't have to hope that we have eternal life. We don't have to guess that we have eternal life. We don't have to wait till we die to see if we have eternal life. We possess that the moment we receive Christ as our Savior. And, and there's, a, there's a gratitude that comes with that. There's a realization that I, I, I owe God something. Now, we can never pay for what, what He's done. But just gratitude says, I want to live my life for the one who gave me eternal life. I want to do something for the one who I owe my life to and I owe eternal life to. And so I think that's what David had in his heart. And, and God gives David some reasons here. Now he tells David, you won't build the house. You've been a man of war and God said, I'm not going to have you build it. Solomon, your son, will build the house. He'll be the one that will build it and we know it as Solomon's temple. But David prepared mightily for that and prepared very well for that. And he gave, gives David some reasons here why he ought to build the house and why he should build a house for God. And I'm going to kind of draw some parallels to that as to why we ought to belong to a New Testament Baptist church. Now, understand something, I didn't say we ought to build a church because we can't build a church. I take that back. Man can build a church, but it's not the kind of church God wants. Jesus said that He'll build His church. 
We just happen to get in on it. And, and by the way, he will, he will use us to help build that church. That's what we're here for. We want to be used by God. And so, uh, why should I belong? We live in a day when the church is very minimalized. And people don't think much of the church. The latest survey I saw by George Barna uh, predicted that in just, he said by 2025, which is now only nine years away, that less than 50% of professing Christians will put church as an important part of their spiritual growth and development. And that's tragic. That's tragic. We have, we're, we're losing the importance of church. And, and, and while, listen, there's a, there's, a, there's a movement abounding right now that, is, that says, well, you don't go to church, you just be the church. But the danger with that is, you don't go to church. You just stay home because you are the church. And so you can just be at home and you're okay. They call that the emerging church. It's part of that movement. That is not in the Bible. That is not of God. And so there's a, the Bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We talked this morning about 3 John in Sunday school and how uh, the three different kinds of church members and the diatrophies who wanted to have the preeminence, wanted to be the, the, the big shot, and he wanted everybody to, to follow him and recognize him in the church. And he wanted to reject anybody he didn't like and, and, and just, just was a, a problem in the church. And that was in a church that was probably around 100 A.D. Not much but uh, 60 years, maybe 70 years at the most after Jesus ascended back to heaven. And so those problems are not new. And so when he says, don't forsake the assembling yourselves together as the manner of some is, that's not a 21st century phenomena. There were people in those days that thought it was okay to forsake the assembling of yourself together. But it is not okay. The Bible says we ought to want to get together so much the more as you see the day approaching. We ought to be looking for more reasons. So let's look at this uh, passage here this evening, shall we? And uh, talk about why we ought to belong to a New Testament Baptist church. Some of the reasons to, uh, to, to David it would apply certainly to us tonight. And number one, I think you ought to belong to a New Testament Baptist church because you're reminded of and you learn His commandments. Notice, if you will, with me, verse number 8. The Bible says, Therefore in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and leave it for inheritance to your children after you forever. Keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God. Now it's interesting, the, the arrangement of those words, isn't it? I would have written it and said, Seek and keep. But God arranged it and said, Keep and and seek for all the commandments of God. Because there's no need to seek for more if you're not obeying, if you're not keeping what you already know. There's no use to say, Lord, show me more commandments if you're not obeying the commandments that you already know. It was Mark Twain who said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand that bother me. And so we have to understand the Bible you know for God to give you more commandments to seek. And you know... What you do when you come to church? You come to church to find the commandments of God. You come to church to find out what does God expect of from me? What does the Lord thy God require of thee? What does God want from my life? What does the Lord desire? What are His commandments? I want to learn the commandments of God. I want to keep the commandments of God. I want to know what God wants me to do. And where do I learn those? I'm going to learn those when I come to church. And I come to church and somebody opens the Bible and they teach me the Word of God. And I'll understand what God expects of me. You understand, it was a church that I learned about salvation. It was a church that I learned about baptism and what that was all about and what God expected for me in baptism. It's a church that I learned about serving the Lord. It was a church I learned about soul winning. It was a church I learned about tithing. It was a church I learned about separation from the world. 
and being separated unto God. It was at church that I learned the fact that Jesus is coming again and that He's coming back for us. It was at church that I understood justification and understood sanctification and understood glorification, understand pleasing God. You see, I, I come to church to hear this is the way, walk ye in it. I come to learn the commands of God. I want to know what God expects of me. You see, we tend to live in a day and age where it's like the book of Judges. Where if you read the end of the book of Judges, it says there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Everybody just wants to do what's right in their own eyes. But my friend, you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, we do not do what's right in our eyes. We are, we are bound to do what's right in His eyes. We are bound to do what's right and what God says is right, not what we think is right. We no longer are free. We, we're not our own. The Bible says we've been bought with a price. What's the price? The blood of Jesus Christ. He purchased us when He died on the cross on Calvary. And now I'm no longer my own. I belong to Jesus Christ. And so I can't do what I think and what I want and what I feel. I'm bound to do what He wants and what He thinks and what He feels. And I'll never know what that is if I don't learn His commandments. And so I have to come to church. And I need to come to church to hear the preaching of God's Word and the teaching of God's Word so I'll know what is right in God's eyes. I'm not concerned. Listen, you're not concerned what I think is right in my eyes. And, and I love you, but I'm not really concerned what you think is right in your eyes. What we're all ought to be concerned about is what is right in God's eyes. How does God see this? And know what the Bible says about it. Now, why? You say, well, preacher, what's the big deal about keeping His commandments? Well, Jesus said something very important in John chapter 14 and verse 15. You know what He said? If you love Me, keep My commandments. Well, that makes it rather important. It's really interesting. You know, we, we deal with married couples and we, we go through what's called the love languages. There's, there's, there's just ways to express love to people in a language that they understand. It's, uh, who was, uh, who are we talking to? Was it Brother, was it Brother Yoder talking? Somebody about the being in another country and not knowing the language and trying to communicate with, you know, people and, and they don't know what you're saying, you don't know what they're saying and and it's, it's awful difficult. That's, and, and that's the way it is. If you're trying to express love to somebody and in a, then they don't understand your language at all, it's very difficult for them to feel like you're really loving them. You really care about them. And so there's different, there's, there's words of affirmation. All right, there's five basic love languages. There's words of affirmation. There's gifts. There's quality time. There's um, physical touch and uh, acts of service. Those are the five, five basic. Now, and all it means is, there's, there's some of you, you, you say, I'll have a couple come in and the wife will say, well, my husband doesn't love me. He said, doesn't love you? Look at the house I gave you to live in. Look at the car I gave you to drive. Look at the jewelry I buy you. Look at the nice clothes you get to wear. Yeah, but you know what she says? She says, he never talks to me. Never spends any time with me. He never wants to do anything together. Here's the thing. He thinks, because I give her all these gifts, I'm telling her I love her. But he's speaking a language that she doesn't understand. Her, her language is quality time. And if she doesn't spend any quality time, he doesn't spend any quality time with her, she doesn't feel loved at all. He's speaking the wrong language. Okay? Now, I say all that, just say this. And, and, and it, it, when it comes to Jesus Christ, what's his love language? If you love me, keep my commandments. I would say probably acts of service, huh? So I tell Jesus I love him every day. No, if you love me, keep my commandments. I tell Jesus I love him every day. Click, click. Whoa. No, if you love me, keep my commandments. Hey, I haven't seen you in church for a month. Oh, I I'm still, I'm still love Jesus, preacher. No, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. I need a place. And by the way, listen, 
you, you don't get mad. You need a place that reminds you of the commandments of God. You need somebody who's willing to, for you to get a little upset to say, mm, he's right. Okay? All right? You ever do that? You get angry with somebody first, then you sit down and you start thinking about it and thinking, I know why I'm mad. Is that right? Every husband knows that feeling. So I need a place to remind me to tell me what God expects of me. Number two. Number two. Verse number eight again. He says, not only do I need a place to keep and seek all the commandments of the Lord your God, but he says, you may possess this land and notice, leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. You know why you belong to New Testament Baptist Church? You can leave an inheritance to your children. Parents leave their children houses or house and land and money or a business or material possessions. Hey, why not leave them an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, soul-winning Baptist church? Why not say, hey, in my will, I'm willing to you an independent, Bible-believing, soul-winning, separated Baptist church. That's my inheritance I'm leaving to you. Leave them a church that believes the Bible. Leave them a church that believes in running bus routes. Leave them a church that believes in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Leave them a church that believes in the songs of God and believes in convictions and believes in standards to live by and desires to please God. You don't just do the church. You don't just come to church for you. You're doing it for those who come after you. We're enjoying an auditorium tonight and we're enjoying the building. But listen, you understand, most of the people who built this building are not here anymore. I mean, they're not on earth anymore. They've gone on to their reward. You say, why'd they build it? They built it so we can enjoy it. And we, we do what we do. We do it not just for us, but we're doing it so when these little ones grow up, they'll have a church to come to. They'll have a place to come to learn the commandments of God. We do it for the next generation. Oh, my friend, if God tarries and we go another 50 years, listen, they are going to need a church like this. They're going to need a Bible Baptist church. Churches today are viewed as powerless and irrelevant and un unnecessary and optional. And that's a far cry from the believers we find in the Scripture and the churches we find in the Bible. It's interesting, when Saul got saved, you read it in Acts chapter 9, if he got saved, the Bible says he joined himself to the disciples there in Damascus. He, he right away, he understood, hey, I'm saved. I'm, I'm now a believer. I need to belong somewhere. I need to be a part of something. And he joined himself to those believers. And he was daily there in the synagogue and he was preaching Christ. He confused the people in Damascus. They thought, man, this is the guy who was destroying Christians and now he's preaching the Christ that he once tried to destroy. They'll need this place. You need the church to gather with other believers. You need the place to serve God. They'll need this church to train their children. They'll need this church to bring their lost friends and family and neighbors. They'll need this place to hear the commands of God. What, what an inheritance you leave to your children when you leave them a Bible-believing Baptist church. Don't underestimate that. My friend, that's a great treasure that you give to your children and your grandchildren. If you left them that and you left them nothing else, they're very rich indeed. And if you left them everything else and all sorts of wealth and money and houses and lands and you left them nothing spiritually and no church with which to go to, you left them a paltry inheritance. We belong to a New Testament church. It reminds me to keep and to seek the commandments of God. Allows me to leave an inheritance to my children. Number three, notice verse number 12. 
the Bible says here, in the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, of the courts of the house of the Lord, and of all the chambers round about, of the treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries of the dedicated things, also for the courses of the priests and the Levites, and for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and for all the vessels of service in the house of the Lord. It's a place of service. Why do I belong to a New Testament church, Baptist church? Because it gives me a place to serve God. The priests and the Levites all served in the temple continually. Well, when you go into the New Testament, you tell me, who are the priests in the New Testament? You're looking at them. Hold a mirror up, look in there and say, I see one right there. Okay? That's a believer priest. Priest was someone who went to God on behalf of the people. Okay? We don't, have, we don't need any priests now. We don't need anybody with a, with a collar on backward or any other way. We don't need anybody to go to God on our behalf. I don't have to go to God on your behalf. Every man, there's one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. The only, every, every one of us have equal access to God. Call that the, the priesthood of the believer. Everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ, because you know Christ, you have access to God. You have ac- equal access. Every one of us can come boldly to the throne of grace. So all of us are priests. And, and notice the priests were there to serve continually. They, they were continually in the service of the Lord. So that, listen, that new, the, the tabernacle there with the priests, that was a place of continual activity. And the New Testament church ought to be a place of continual activity. It's a place of service. It's a place where people are busy serving the Lord with their life. It's a place of excitement. It's a place of enthusiasm. It's the New Testament local church. It's a place where you give your life to serve God. Well, I want to witness for God. Then you grab tracks out of the track rack and you go soul winning. And when they get saved, what do you do with these new disciples? Tell them, God bless you, man. Do the best you can. No, you bring them into the church. See, the Lord, when those 3,000 got saved on Pentecost, the Lord added unto them. The them were the 120 that already met in the upper room. And now there's 3,120 that are gathered together. You want to teach Sunday school? You have Sunday school classes that you can teach. Want to work with children? We have children's church and we have a bus ministry that you can reach boys and girls for Christ. Sing for the Lord. We have a choir and special music opportunities for you to sing for the Lord. Want to usher? Clean the church? Work with the addicted and reformers unanimous? Or the prison on the RU inside? Or go to the nursing homes? And be a blessing to people who who many times are forgotten about and neglected? You can work in the nursing home ministry. Wednesday night Bible clubs, missions trips. Oh listen, it's a place for me to serve. There's something in your heart. There ought to be something in your heart to say, God has saved me and God has given me eternal life. I want to give my life in service to Him. I want to give something back to Him. And the avenue He's provided, the vehicle He's used to to give you that outlet is the local church. He uses the church as a place to serve. Let me say this. I serve in the church because I love Jesus Christ. I serve in the church because I love Jesus Christ. Well, nobody appreciates me. Well, I didn't start serving so people would appreciate me. Why would I stop? Because people don't appreciate me. Well, somebody somebody said something to me. Well, I didn't start serving because somebody said something to me. Why would I stop serving because somebody said something to me? You see? Don't, 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 don't make it about you. Don't make it, listen, I'm serving because I love the Lord Jesus. And the only reason I'd stop serving is if I stopped loving the Lord Jesus. Boy, that would change some things, huh? Just keep serving Him. Continue to serve because you love Jesus. I belong to the church because I can keep and seek the commandments of God. Because I can leave an inheritance to my children of a, 
of a Bible-believing New Testament church. I can have, it's a place for me to serve and to live for God. And then, number four, verse number 10. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Nike thought they came up with that. God had it many years ago. They thought they were real big when they said, just do it. No, God said that way back then. He said, be strong and do it. Chosen thee to build the house of God. God's chosen us <coughs> to be a part of Him and to partner with Him in building an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, separated, soul-winning Baptist church. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be strong and do it. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Well, preacher, that takes time. Be strong and do it. Well, preacher, that will take some, some money. Well, be strong and do it. Well, preacher, that'll, that'll, that's, gonna, that's not going to be easy. Well, be strong and do it. You see, let's, let's not make excuses. Let's make the effort. Let's just say, this is what God asked me to do. This is our time that we've received the baton from the runner that has run before us, and now we run the race until one day we'll run our final lap and we'll stretch out to hand the baton to the next generation, some of these young people in here, and it'll be their turn to take the baton and run with it. But right now it's our leg to run the race. Let's be strong and let's run a good race. Let's do our part in being part of the work of God. It'll take faith. Be strong and do it. It'll take dying to self. Be strong and do it. There'll be casualties. Be strong and do it. We either make excuses or we make the effort. You know, remember the New Testament? The Jews actually came to Jesus on behalf of a centurion. They wanted Jesus to, to, to help this man. And the reason they gave Jesus was this. He loveth our nation, for he hath built us a synagogue. That he loves our nation. How do you know he loves your nation? He built us a synagogue. Do you love your nation? What's one of the best things you can do to show that you love your nation? Build them a church. Be part of a church. America needs to get back to church again. And church needs to get back to God again. We're not coming, listen, we don't come for the recreation. You don't come for the fellowships. You don't come for all the extra frills and, and things that people now have in, to, to, to try to make up for church. Let's get back where we come to church to, to meet with God. We come to church to hear what God wants to tell us. We'll impact our country again. But we have to get back to, as I said this morning, we'll never make America great again until America makes God great again. Until that happens, it, it won't take place. Another tragedy today in Louisiana. More policemen shot and killed. Got to pray for America. But prayer, listen, prayer will never replace disobedience. Prayer won't cancel out disobedience. If you don't plan on trying to obey the Lord, listen, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you to come to me and say, Pastor, pray for me. Not if you're planning on being disobedient anyway. When Achan had disobeyed, and taken of the gold and the silver and the garments from Jericho. Remember what? And then they went up to Ai and 36 men lost their lives. They came back. What did Joshua do? Man, he got on his face before God started praying. What did God do? Yeah. He kicked him inside and said, Get up off your face. He said, Boy, Man, you know what God said? It's not time to pray. It's time to take care of the sin in the camp. I'm, I'm not against praying for America, but I think America needs to take care of the sin in the camp. Let's take care of the sin in the camp. And I'm, I'm for praying for our churches and praying for revival, but listen, the first step is let's take care of the sin that's in our lives. 
Why is it that the, the, the church houses are struggling and, and we're struggling for attendance and struggling for people, but boy, the football stadiums and the sports stadiums are full. The bars are full. The, the entertainment places are full. The concert venues are full. God's people need to get back to loving God again. People, listen, as things get difficult, and things will get more difficult, if Jesus tarries, things are going to get rough in this country. People are going to understand that the, the rock and roll Christianity isn't what they need. They're going to find out that's not where it's at. The, the article I read this week, I sent it to Brother Bob, a link of a church where this guy, the, the band that plays for the church, the, the drummer hit the wrong pedal or something on his drum and it, it, it went to a rock band that he plays in and it started playing, what did they call that, head banging? Music or something like that. And, and he started going nuts. And, and anybody, you know, I mean, playing the guitar and, and then people started doing the same thing. In a, in a Sunday church service. What was it the church secretary said? She couldn't tell. She body surfed down to the front. Church service. What they call a church service. Hmm? Can I help you with something? That's not church. That's a crowd of people gathered together, but that's not New Testament church. And folks are going to realize that. They're going to realize it's not entertainment. It's not fluff. This is, this is the real deal. This is serious business. And God will get, a, God will get our attention. When judgment begins, it will begin at the house of God. And so we have to be prepared. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of building... God and being part of God building an independent New Testament Bible believing Baptist church. That's what I want to be a part of. So I've spent, I spent my life doing and I want to do it till the day the Lord calls me home. I hope you do too. Let's be strong and do it. Now to be a part of a New Testament Baptist church. It's not just a gathering of people who like each other. Because we don't like each other. But, thanks, Sandra, at least somebody got it. Um, no, 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 no. It's not like, well, I like everybody there, everybody's so friendly, or everybody's so nice. No, 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 no. It, it, listen, a church in the Bible is a called-out assembly. And in, in the case of a New Testament church, it's a called-out assembly of believers. Now, not just believing, but believing in, belief has to have an object. And we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. That he, he came to earth, He lived a perfect sinless life, and yet He went and died on the cross for our sins. Okay, That He died in our place. He died for us. Because we were sinners with no hope of going to heaven. As sinners, we deserve to die and pay our penalty for sin in hell. We would be forever separated from God with no hope of going to heaven. But then we heard what Jesus did for us. It, it, variety of different ways people found out about it. Some cases a friend told them. Some cases somebody knocked the door. Somebody heard it on the radio. Somebody came to church and heard a sermon and they responded to the sermon. Many different ways to get to Jesus, but there's only one way to get to heaven and that's through Jesus Christ. And they called on Jesus and asked Him to be their Savior, asked Him to forgive their sin, and they received eternal life. Then they follow the Lord in baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism just pictures what takes place in your heart. Baptism picturing that you believe Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again for your sins. When you get baptized, everybody's seeing that you believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for you. And you're being obedient to God by being baptized. You're identifying yourself with Christ. You're identifying yourself with other believers. Then you become a part of a local body of believers. You know, you ever think about that? The church called, God, Jesus called the church his body. Let me ask you a question. That, that's why I was saying earlier about how we serve through the local church. We serve in the local church and we serve through the local church because it's his body. You ever, if, if you ever saw an arm or a leg moving by itself with no body, 
you would think it's a little strange. You'd probably want to get away from there. But there's a lot of people who try to do something for God apart from the church, apart from his body. And that's strange, according to the Bible. You should do it through the New Testament church. And so it's a body of believers that are together to serve God. And you join yourself because we, we all uh, have a desire to follow Jesus Christ. You see, the head of the church is Jesus Christ. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, your church. Don't say it's my church. <laughs> it's not my church. It's Jesus Christ's church. The, Lord's, the Lord said He's the head of the church. You see, and we all, in all things, He has the preeminence. And so we look to Him, and we follow Him in all we do. So let's end it with the way the Lord ended it. For David and for Solomon, verse 10, when he just said, be strong and do it. Let's pray. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for giving the instruction here to David and to Solomon, who would eventually build your house. And Lord, I pray that we would place the importance on the church that you do. That we would love the church because Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Lord, I pray that you've spoken to people's hearts tonight and we would understand how vital and how important it is to belong to a New Testament Baptist church. We want to know, we want to keep, and we want to seek the commandments of God because we do want Jesus to know that we love Him. Not by mouth, but by our actions. We want to leave an inheritance for the next generation. Well, I want my children and my grandchildren to have a Bible-believing Baptist church to go to. Father, I want a place where I can serve you with my life. But out of gratitude and love for you, for what you've done for me, I can give my life a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you. That's my reasonable service. Father, I pray you'd help us to be strong and do it. You've called us to do that. You've chosen us to be in this place at this time. Help us to run our leg of the race and keep our eyes on Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this evening and say, Pastor, I, I know that if I died tonight, I would go to heaven. Pastor, I mean there's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner and that I needed to be saved and that Jesus was the Savior. And I called on Jesus Christ and from my heart I asked Him to be my Savior. And I know I have eternal life tonight, Pastor. And I'm confident that if Jesus came back tonight or if I went into eternity tonight that I would be in heaven. Could I see your hand for a minute if you're confident of that? Would you slip it up? As a testimony, I know that I'm saved. Okay, you may put them down. If you're here tonight would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. Maybe you didn't even know anybody could know that for sure. You say, Pastor, but I'm, I'm concerned about where I'd go for eternity. I'm concerned. I want to go to heaven, but I'm not sure I will. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not, I'll not embarrass you or call you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down? I see it. Thank you. Anybody else say, Pastor, pray for me? Pray for me. God bless you. Now, how many believers here tonight would say, Pastor, understand how important it is to belong? the New Testament Baptist Church. I do want to keep and seek the commandments of God. I do want to leave that inheritance to my children, my grandchildren. I do want a place to serve God. And by His grace, I'll be strong and I'll do it. Pastor, the, the Lord spoke to my heart tonight. Pray for me. 
Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. If God has spoken to your heart tonight, I want you to respond to Him, would you? I want you to do exactly what He's bidding you to do in your heart. Just tell Him, use me, God, to be a part of a New Testament Baptist church. Whatever else the Lord has laid in your heart, I just want you to say yes to Him. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you want somebody to talk to you about that, we have people who've been trained. They'll take a Bible. They'll take you aside. And they'll talk to you about knowing Jesus as your Savior. When others are coming to pray, you just slip out from your seat and you come. You join them. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. I pray your will will be done now in each heart and life. I pray that no one will resist you tonight, God, but each one would do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. Have your own way now, Lord, in every heart and life, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. All oh, to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender Humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures so forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. Oh, to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Our Father, we bow before you in prayer now this evening. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness to us and for meeting with us today and speaking to our hearts. Lord, I don't have any desire just to go through the motions of church. I pray, God, that we'd be very serious about what you've called us to do. There's people's lives at stake. Lord, I pray we'd understand how serious the task is that we live for God and we do your will for our lives. Thank you for a church. Thank you for those who've gone before us, left us this inheritance. And we want to run the race and leave it for our children and their children after us. And Lord, I pray that you'd continue to work in our hearts and our lives. 
I pray, Lord, that we would live our life this week and we'd be very mindful of your presence and we would live depending on you each and every moment, each and every day this week. Give us the victory in Jesus that we sing about. May others see him in our lives. We love you. We thank you for a wonderful Lord's Day together. Dismiss us now with your care and with your blessing. Give each and every one safety as we travel to our different homes. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, shall we? It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.